And we're grateful to be in the house of worship one more time. I love it when the psalmist said, I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. He didn't say I was sad or I was mad. How many of you came in glad? And as my grandmother would say, the glad glads. Amen to be in the house of the Lord. We do honor our lead pastor, Pastor David Jock, in his absence, and all of uh, our pastors and campus leaders, Kasimi, Creole, uh, that are worshiping today. I think our David, Pastor David P. and our Creole campus are celebrating Haitian Mother's Day on tonight, and we just pray that all goes well with them. Amen. We're going to continue. Uh, today is the last uh, message in the series of Protect this house. Last week, we talked about Samson, and today, uh, I want to talk about a king, one of my favorite um, kings in the Bible, and because this is also children slash youth Sunday uh, as well, <laughs> I want to talk about a young man who was one of the youngest kings that ever took the throne in Israel. His name is Josiah. You want to know about Josiah. You want to know how God used him. You want to know the reforms and the things that he said and the things that he did that made him a great king. The Bible says that there was not a king like him before or after him. Now that says a lot about this young man named Josiah. Before we really get into the meat of scripture, now, if you don't like reading, if you don't like scripture, this message is going to bore you today because there's a lot of verses we're going to read. And I, I purposely wanted to read all these verses so that you can get a biblical context of what I want to talk about today about Josiah. Let me just talk about his granddaddy for a minute. His granddaddy was Manasseh. Now Manasseh was 12 years old when he became king. Now Josiah was eight years old. I'm gonna talk about that in a minute. His granddaddy, can you imagine a 12 year old becoming the president of the United States? That, that doesn't even make any sense, right? Now, I often say they ought to let um, teenagers run for the presidency because they already know everything. Um, <laughs> but I know that won't happen. But Manasseh, his granddaddy, was 12 years old when he became king, and he reigned 55 years in Jerusalem. The Bible said that he did what was evil in the Lord's sight imitating the detestable practices of the nations that the Lord had dispossessed before the Israelites. So you remember, um, after Moses came Joshua. Joshua led them into the promised land, but in order to get into the promised land, they had to get rid of the Canaanites. And the reason why they had to get rid of the Canaanites, the Canaanites were a terrible group of people. And God now you people, people talk about, well, God is this angry. I heard somebody ask a question the other, other night that uh, God is this angry God. He's an he's a evil God because of, you know, what he did in the Old Testament and destroying people. Let me tell you something about God. God allowed 400 years. He was merciful over these evil nations that would not change. He was merciful, allowed them to live out their evilness for hundreds of years before he removed them. Okay, so what were the Canaanites guilty of? Idolatry, serving idol gods. They also mastered the art of incest. You talk about um, all kinds of ungodly relationships amongst family members, the Canaanites mastered that. Witchcraft and sorcery, Adultery was rampant amongst the Canaanites. Child sacrifice. They killed children just so that they could become wealthy. Unholy and unapproved sexual practices. 
and bestiality, having relations with inhumane or, or, or animals or things other than a human. These were the Canaanites. And the Bible said that Manasseh, Josiah's grandfather, imitated all of these practices of these nations and he made God super angry. All right, so that's, that's Manasseh. Then Josiah's daddy came along. When, when Manasseh died, his father Ammon came along and the Bible says he did what was evil in the sight of the Lord like his father. Now he was so bad that the people that he led, he, only, he was only king for two years. His father was 55 years. Ammon only led two years and they assassinated him from within. And then all of a sudden, who was left? An eight-year-old boy named Josiah. So I just gave you the kind of the backdrop of this. Let's go to the scriptures. <coughs> now, a number of these verses I cut off because the details that were cut off were not necessarily pertinent uh, for um, the, the story or for the message today. Not to say that you know, that, that information is not something that we shouldn't read. I just wanted to cut off as much as possible because we're going to be reading a bunch of verses. So here's the, let's, let's, let's dive right in. <coughs> Excuse me. Second Kings 21, starting the first verse. Manasseh was 12 years old when he became king and he reigned 55 years in Jerusalem. He did what was evil in the Lord's sight, imitating the detestable practices of the nations that the Lord had dispossessed before the Israelites. He built the high places that his father Hezekiah had destroyed and reestablished. Now King Hezekiah he did what was right. Destroyed um, those uh, evil altars but his son Manasseh reestablished the altar of Baal. He made an Asherah. I'll talk about that in a minute. He also bowed and worshiped to all the stars in the sky and served them. Instead of worshiping God, um, Manasseh served and worshiped the stars. Let's keep reading. He built altars in the Lord's temple where the Lord had said, Jerusalem is where I will put my name. He sacrificed his son. Now, watch this now. Josiah's granddaddy had another son which was Josiah's uncle, his granddaddy sacrificed his son in the fire. Just think about that. Threw him in the fire so that he can gain power. He practiced witchcraft, divination, consulted mediums and spirits, spiritists. He did a huge amount of evil in the Lord's sight, angering him. But they did not listen. Manasseh caused them to stray so that they did worse evil than the nations the Lord had destroyed before the Israelites. I want you to think about that. Manasseh had led Israel in such a bad way, they were worse than the Canaanites that they got rid of. He did not protect the house of the Lord. He did not protect his own house. He did not protect the house of the Lord. 11 verse says, Since King Manasseh of Judah has committed all these detestable acts, Worse evil than the Amorites who preceded him had done. And by means of his idols has also caused Judah to sin. This is what the Lord, Lord God of Israel says. I'm about to bring such disaster on Jerusalem and Judah that everyone who hears about it will shudder. Manasseh also shed much innocent blood that he filled Jerusalem with blood, basically with, with the killing of people from one end to another. This was in addition to the sin that he caused Judah to commit so that he did what was evil in the Lord's sight. 
18 verse, Manasseh rested with his father and was buried in the garden of his own house, the garden of Uzzi. His son Ammon became king in his place. Ammon was 22 years old when he became king and he reigned two years in Jerusalem. He did what was evil in the Lord's sight, just as his father Manasseh had done. He walked in all the ways his father had walked. He served the idols his father had served. He bowed and worshiped to them. He abandoned the Lord God of his ancestors and did not walk in the ways of the Lord. Ammon's servants conspired against him and put the king to death in his own house. The common people, just regular people, killed all who had conspired against King Ammon and they made his son Josiah king in his place. Josiah was how old? How old was he? Eight years old when he became king and he reigned 31 years in Jerusalem he did what was right <coughs> in the sight of the Lord and walked in the ways of his ancestor David not his father Ammon not his grandfather Manasseh he did not turn to the right or to the left now I want to show you what two eight-year-olds I thought I pulled up the picture of my grandsons Look at, look, look at these fellas. Now that's Jalen on the right. He's eight. And this is little Nathan. And he's dressed like an old man at school for that particular day. Now even looking like an old man, can anyone think of any reason why a country should be entrusted to an eight-year-old? Imagine being king over a nation at eight years old. That's what an eight-year-old looks like. This is Josiah. Eight years old. And he did what was right in the sight of the Lord. He did not turn to the left. Proverbs 4.27 says, don't get sidetracked. Keep your feet from following evil. In other words, to, me, to, me, uh, to say he didn't uh, turn to the right or to the left, he did not go after evil he kept his feet from following evil even though he had an evil daddy and an evil grandfather let's keep reading 2nd Kings 22 and 11 when the king heard the words of the book of the law this is Josiah <coughs> he tore his clothes this little boy says go and inquire of the Lord for me the people in all Judah about the words in this book that has been found for great is the Lord's wrath that is kindled against us because our ancestors have not obeyed the words of this book. This is what the Lord says. I am about to bring disaster on this place and on its inhabitants because they have abandoned me and burned incense to other gods in order to anger me with all the work of their hands. My wrath will be kindled against this place and it will not be quenched. But look at what God says to Josiah. But Josiah, because your heart was tender and you humbled yourself before the Lord when you heard what I spoke against this place and against its inhabitants, that they would become a desolation and a curse. And because you have torn your clothes and wept before me, I myself have heard. This is the Lord's declaration. Therefore, I will indeed gather you to your fathers. And you will be gathered to your grave in peace. Your eyes, Josiah, will not see the disaster that I'm bringing on this place. Then they reported to the king. I'm going to tell you something. God was so mad. He was so mad that what he was about to bring on Israel, because of Josiah, he put a pause on his anger. You know what? I ain't going to mess with Judah. I'm not going to mess with Israel while Josiah is king. But soon as Josiah gets off the scene, it's on. It's, it's on and popping in Israel. Let's keep reading, 2 Kings 23. Then the king went to the Lord's temple with all the men of Judah. These are the things that Josiah did. Wow. This little fella, this little boy, God used him mighty. With all the men of Judah and all the inhabitants of Jerusalem, all the people from the youngest to the oldest, he... He, this is this Josiah, he read in their hearing all the words of the book of the covenant. In other words, Josiah's king, you know, we just had story time and adult reading to children. 
But in this case, you had a child reading to adults. And he was reading to them the book of the law. Say, this is what you have forgotten. If we are going to be God's people, let us get back to the word of God. Next, the king stood by the pillar and made a covenant in the Lord's presence to follow the Lord and to keep his commands, his decrees, and his statutes with all his heart, with all his soul, in order to carry out the words of this covenant that were written in the book. And guess what? All the people agreed to the covenant. <laughs> Almost done. Let's keep reading. Then he did away with the idolatrous priests, got rid of them, them them idolatrous priests, the kings of Judah had appointed to burn incense at the high places. They had burned incense to Baal and to the sun, moon, constellations, and all the stars in the sky. It, in, in other words, the priest, instead of worshiping God, they invited people to come into the temple not to worship God, but to worship idols. Think about that. And he also, Josiah, tore down the houses of the male cult prostitutes that were in the Lord's temple. I want you to understand what's going on. In the, I, okay, let's bring it, let's break it down to so you can understand it. Imagine coming to the Holden Heights campus and all the men of the Holden Heights campus, we all dressed in Speedos. Y'all ain't saying nothing. Right? And got our stomach, some stomachs would be out and in, we don't know how all that stuff. But anyway, people coming into the temple to have intimate interaction with the men inside the temple. God is looking at all of this and say, what in the world are my people doing? I got rid of all of that stuff in the Canaanites and instead of worshiping me, they adopted the life of the Canaanites and brought it into the temple. But Josiah, he tore down those houses, got rid of the male cult prostitutes in which the women were weaving tapestries for Asherah. The king tore down the altars that the kings of Judah had made on the roof of Ahaz's upper chamber. He also tore down the altars that Manasseh had made in the two courtyards of the Lord's temple. Last couple of verses for this section of reading. In addition, Josiah eradicated all the mediums. He went after all the witchcraft folk, the spiritists, the household idols, the images, all the abhorring things that were seen in the land of Judah and in Jerusalem. He did this in order to carry out the words of the law that were written in the book that the priest Hilkiah found in the Lord's temple. Last verse 25. Watch what it says. I love this. Before him, there was no king like him who turned to the Lord with all his heart, with all his soul, with all his strength, according to the law of Moses. And no one like him arose after him. This is an eight-year-old king. He started out at eight years. And his administration lasted 31 years. So that tells me he had to have died at the age of 39. Man, that's young to die. But all the stuff that he went through, maybe all that stress on him just killed him. Who knows? So Josiah is one of the youngest kings ever to reign at... Bless the Lord. Bless the Lord. Okay, anyway. Josiah, one of the youngest kings ever to reign at eight years old. Josiah's name means the one Jehovah heals. The one that God heals. His granddaddy and his daddy were as evil as you can get. They were worse than the Canaanite kings. They angered God so much, he pledged to destroy them. But Josiah protected his house. He protected his house from idolatry. And the idolatry that he protected them from was Baal. The reason why they worship Baal, because Baal meant power. They worship Baal because they wanted power. Power. You know how it is. Uh, today, people go after, it says that men go after money, sex, and power, and all those things. It started long time ago. And the Asherah, Asherah or Asher, was a female goddess 
And the reason why they worship this female goddess is because she represented money and happiness. So Baal represented power. The female goddess Asherah represented money and happiness. And the reason why they dedicated children to them to kill them was out of, in, in other words, the children were either inconveniencing them or they would dedicate these children to these idol gods so that they would have a more convenient life. Josiah protected his house from that. He protected his house from incest, ungodly sexual or unholy alliances with family. Huh. Every family got his issues. Every family has drama. There's all kinds of stories in everybody's family. Josiah is no different. He had a daddy was the, was off the chain. He had a grandfather that was off the chain. And if you keep reading the story about Josiah, when he died, his son came after him. And guess what? His son, instead of following the holy lifestyle of his father, Josiah's son decided to be like his grandfather and great-grandfather. So Josiah is this holy young man that is sandwiched between people before him and people after him that chose evil instead of God. Josiah protected his house from witchcraft and sorcery, meaning seeking help from the kingdom of darkness or any substance. Watch this. When you, when, when you protect yourself from witchcraft and sorcery, you're protecting yourself from seeking help from the kingdom of darkness or any substance that can alter the mind and influence you either for self or to do harm to another person. What I mean by that is, in the Greek, the word witchcraft means pharmakia. And pharmakia is where we get pharmacy or medicine, right? Or drugs. And so one form of witchcraft is that when one partakes of drugs or any substance that can alter your mind, it could be alcohol or drugs, you are actually entering into a form of witchcraft. If you let it get to a point, now some things is just totally illegal and you shouldn't do. And there are some things that people say you can do in moderation, but if you do too much of it and it alters your mind, at the point in which it alters your mind and you're able to make decisions unbecoming of yourself, you have just allowed yourself to be engulfed with witchcraft. Josiah said, I'm not having none of these spiritists and sorcery in my house. Adultery. Adultery was rampant in Israel at that time. You know what adultery is? Seeking gratification or companionship from someone or something other than one's spouse. It could include pornography. Pornography is a form of adultery. Fornication is the Greek word pornea, which is where we get pornography. It's a, for, it's a sin to allow oneself to be gratified by someone other than your spouse. It also could include intimate conversations with another person that isn't your spouse. Some people have emotional adultery. That's a whole nother lesson. It could be work, ministry. Huh. People can commit adultery with work, with ministry by putting other things as priority in your life when it should be God first and if you're married then your spouse sometimes it's work sometimes it's ministry that is also a form of adultery child sacrifice they sacrifice children for the purpose of attaining power wealth and happiness they got rid of the child for the sake of convenience and a better life Sounds familiar? Unholy and unapproved sexual practices. God sanctions marriage 
and sexuality between a man and his wife or a woman and her husband. Anything outside of that is uncivilized, unholy, and God does not approve of it. So that means there's a man even want to live with his girlfriend. That is not approved by God. It's all about the marital union. And I know this is not a popular message because, you know, you, you don't get a whole lot of amens on this kind of stuff. So let me just say this. Give you these points. I'm going to get on out the way. Protecting your house is a choice. You have the choice to protect. Now, when I say house, I'm talking three-dimensionally. This house, the house that you live in, this physical house, the house that you reside in, your home where your family is, the house of God. When I say protect your house, I'm talking about protecting all of you, you, your home. In other words, even at home, there are certain things we would not allow our children to watch. Not only that, there are certain things that we would not watch around them or even by ourselves. Because it's all about is setting an environment in the house where the family can flourish in God. And there are things that we can engage in, we can listen to and watch that can interrupt the environment of our home and then it causes us to be vulnerable to the attack of the enemy and next thing you know, you have an unprotected house. And you wonder why. What have you been watching? What have you been allowing to get through this eye gate and the ear gate and in your spirit? For Josiah, he didn't want none of those things. So it's a choice. But to God is holding you accountable for what you do. Evil parents and grandparents are no excuse for disobeying God. They're no excuse. Evil parents, none of that. You can't say, well, uh, my daddy was this, my granddaddy was that, so I can't help you. God is holding you accountable for what you do. Josiah had every reason in the world to be an evil person. My granddaddy wasn't no good. My daddy wasn't no good. And then he had his own family, and his son was no good. I want to show you something in the scriptures. There is no such... Watch this. this. This might surprise some of you. There is no such thing as generational curses. But there are generational choices. I, I want, I, and I'm going to broke that down for you now. I want to show you in the word of God. So let's, let's digress to Ezekiel 18, 2, 3, and 20. And then we're going to hit something in Galatians because I'm not going to tell you anything I came back up in Scripture. Watch this. Here's God talking. What do you mean by using this proverb concerning the land of Israel? The fathers eat sour grapes and the children's teeth are set on edge. In other words, that is a proverb that says, whatever the father is guilty of, the child is automatically guilty of the same thing. And God's going to punish the child for what the father has done. And I know people will quote this verse where it says, the sins of the fathers shall be what? Shall be passed down to the children. Well, God is saying, no longer shall you use these kinds of proverbs as i live this is the declaration of the lord god you will no longer use this proverb in israel why because the person who sins is the one who will die a son look at what the scripture says read it for yourself a son won't suffer punishment for the father's iniquity and the father won't suffer punishment for the son's iniquity the righteousness of the righteous person will be on him and the wickedness of the wicked person will be on him. In other words, <laughs> every man for himself and God for us all. 
And then in the New Covenant, Galatians 3, 13 and 14, the reason why I say we can't be cursed and there is no generational curses, especially to the believer. Look at what Galatians 3 says. Christ redeemed us from what? The curse of the law and becoming a curse for us because it is written, cursed is everyone who is hung on a tree. The purpose was that the blessing of Abraham would come to the Gentiles by Christ Jesus so that we could receive the promised spirit through faith. In other words, believers can't be cursed because Jesus became a curse for us. Don't let nobody say, well, you're under curse and what you're going through is because of what your daddy and your granddaddy and, 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 and your uncles them. No, you can't use that proverb anymore. First of all, if you are covered in the blood because Jesus died on the cross, he became a curse for us that we now never have to deal with any curses. We never have to deal with the power of the enemy. Why? Because we have been delivered by the blood of Jesus. Believers can't be cursed, but we can reap, watch this though, but we can reap what we sow through bad choices. Protect your house is about making righteous choices. And Josiah did what was right, though he had a dad and a granddad in his, and a son who did evil. There was no excuses. We, we like to sometimes, well, the reason why I'm going through, listen, forget about all that stuff. Hey, whatever daddy did, whatever granddaddy did, whatever great-great-granddaddy did, all that stuff. Let me tell you something about my family. My great-grandfather walked away from his family and left my grandfather and my aunts and my great-grandmother to fend for themselves. And my grandfather was four years, uh, I'm sorry, he was in the fourth grade, nine years old, somewhere around eight or nine, and dropped out of school so that he can go to work to help take care of his mom and his sisters. He made it into the 20s and joined the Army Air Corps. He ends up getting married to my grandmother. They had a son who was my dad. My grandfather was stationed at, I think it was Elmendorf, Elmendorf, Elmendorf Air Force Base in Anchorage, Alaska. And his commanding officer promised him that he could bring his wife, my grandmother, and my dad to be with him. And then the commanding officer changed his mind, and my grandfather went after him with a butcher knife. I think I've told this story before, but I'm bringing it up for a reason. My grandfather is the product of a father who walked away from him, a father who left his mom to be a single mom to take care of four children. And he, the odds were against him. But when they threw my grandfather in prison in that stockade, and God spoke to him and said, why don't you live right? My grandfather, who was a cussing an army, Air Force guy that you just wouldn't play, he had muscles like you wouldn't believe. We used to like to feel his muscles, and I don't know where he get the muscles from, but he was strong. He said because he used to lift up those, uh, uh, the things that the, 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 the um, trains uh, that they uh, drive over. I don't know what they call them, those, those wooden planks. He had to pick them up and set them down and when he was working. It caused him to get these muscles. But he was a strong man. Nobody would mess with him. But when Jesus became real to him and he turned his life around, my daddy wanted to be like that. And he got saved. And he became a young preacher. Then he gets married and has five children. I'm one of the five. Four boys, one girl, and all four of his sons are pastors. My sister is a principal in, in Georgia, and that is the trajectory of our family, but it started with one person. And yet, we also see that even in the next generation with my siblings and our children, there are things that we are seeing in them that we would have never done ourselves. Things that we see in our children, including my own, it's not what they were raised to do. and It's not who they were raised to become, but they made a choice. 
And I'm not going to sit here and I'm not going, I used to, I done cried all the tears I could cry, I believe. I'm not going to cry over choices that my children are making. Why? They're grown, they're adults, and we have planted the seed in them. Now, some of them are doing good and they're in the church and thank God, but I want to see all of them. I ain't going to be satisfied, God, till you get all of them. Children and young people, well, listen to this. One of the best ways you can protect yourself is to obey and follow the godly example of your parents. If you have godly parents, children, if, you, if, you, if you're young or young at heart, one of the best things you can do is follow the example of godly parents. But also, but pledge to never follow in the footsteps of ungodly parents. So if you had a, a parent that was a drunkard or did drugs or was promiscuous, meaning had multiple partners and had, had a girlfriend here and a, had a girlfriend there and had multiple boyfriends or whatever the case may be, uh, they dealt in pornography. I remember one, <laughs> one gentleman was testifying to me, said, man, when I was a kid, my father brought me into the room and introduced me to pornography. Then he went and got uh, a prostitute to teach me how to have sex. That's what the daddy did. But one of the best things you can do, and then sometimes we watch the men in our life mistreat the women in our life. Or sometimes we see the women in our life mistreating uh, the men in our life or not being a lover of God. One of the best things you can do is to make a decision. You know what? My daddy wasn't right. Granddaddy wasn't right. But you know what? It starts with me. It's going to start with my generation. I'm going to live right. I'm going to do right. I'm going to follow God. I'm going to obey God. I'm going to do what God say do. And who, yes, my, my granddaddy might have been an evil man, but I'm not going to be evil. My daddy might have been a no good uh, rascal, somebody who well, was a rolling stone and wherever he laid his hat was his home. When he died, all he left was on some of y'all temptations folks don't act like y'all been saved all your life y'all know the song papa was a rolling stone wherever he laid his yeah that's he was over here he was over there and sometimes our kids see that our kids see that mama has brought in so many uncles Uncles I ain't seen but one time. How many uncles you got? I got about 20 of them. I only see them a couple of times. But make it up in your mind. Do what is right. It's an intentional way of life. Josiah made a conscience decision to do what is right. Doing what is right is an intentional way of life. Let me bring this home. You know why Josiah was able to do what is right? Because he heard, he humbled, and he had a heart for God. Watch this. 2 Kings 22 and 19 says, Because your heart was tender and you humbled yourself before the Lord, when you heard what I spoke against this place and against this and the inhabitants, because you have torn your clothes and wept before me, I myself have heard. In other words, Josiah put high value on the word of God. He obeyed it. To hear doesn't just mean I hear it. It means to perceive and obey. No wonder the psalmist said, I'll hide his word in my heart that I might not sin. Again, if you ever want to know what to do, when to do it, how to do it, how to live your life, get in the word of God. The word of God, I'm talking about read it, study it, get to know it. Don't just wait to come to the church to get your diet of the word of God. We should be reading and studying it every day throughout the week. And when we come to worship, we're hearing what God wants to say to us corporately. But I've been listening to what he needed to say to me individually all throughout the week. He humbled himself. He submitted to God. He came under. God's authority. He had a heart that was tender. 
He was, in other words, when, it, when the Bible says his heart was tender, that means he was repentant. Josiah was one of those that would say, Lord, forgive me, forgive my people. He, wouldn't, he was one that would confront and be honest about himself and about the people that he led. Finally, altars are for sacrifice, not satisfaction. Altars are for sacrifice, not for sacrifice. What do I mean by that? Sometimes we go to the altar in prayer because we want God to satisfy our needs. But what about going to prayer and say, Lord, what do you need and how can I meet your need? What is God's need? For us to tell the story to others, to be a light in the midst of darkness. That's what God needs. That when I'm on campus as a college student, I know everybody around me might be living any other kind of way, but I'm going to take a stand and live for Jesus. At my job, there are people who may be doing the wrong thing, but as for me, I'm going to do what is right. I'm going to live right. I'm not going to fluff my numbers. I'm going to be honest even if it hurts me. Josiah protected his house by removing the ungodly and the unholy things from his house. And you know what? There may be things that we may need to do and go through our house and sweep it up. When I'm talking about sweeping, I'm not necessarily talking about just the broom. But is there anything around? Is there anything on the walls? Is there anything in my life? Is there anything I'm recording? Is there anything that I'm watching that is detrimental to my spirit? Let me get rid of it. Protect your house. Get rid of anything that would rival the things of God. I love Josiah because before him there was no king like him who turned to the Lord with all his heart and with all his soul and with all his strength according to the law of Moses and no one like him arose after him. Protect your house. 